So you wanna know something kinda cool? You continue to burn fat after your workout is done. Now, this isn't anything crazy new. You've probably heard this before. You've probably heard people instruct you to do specific kinds of workouts because it's going to increase your metabolism through the course of the day. For example, when I was first losing a bunch of weight, people had told me, Thomas, if you weight train, you're gonna actually increase your metabolism through the course of the day. You'll burn more calories over the course of the day than if you just do cardio. Cool thing is, there's actually some truth to that, but I wanted to pick it apart a little bit more. I wanted to find out exactly how long this occurred for. How long do you actually burn fat after a workout? And are there specific kinds of workouts that do actually burn more fat after the workout itself? It all has to do with something known as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And we're gonna break it all down. You are tuned in to the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. New videos every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, and a bunch of other videos throughout the week as well. Make sure you hit that little bell button so you can turn on notifications so you know whenever I go live or post a new awesome video. Also check out highly.com so you can get special pricing on the latest and greatest premium performance apparel that I'm always wearing in my videos. Okay, so excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. What exactly is it? All it is is the afterburn effect. The simplest way that I can explain it is with basic analogy. When you go out and you drive your car and you pull it back in the driveway, it doesn't immediately go cold, right? It stays hot for a while. The engine stays warm for a while. The same thing's happening in your body. Your core temperature is elevated, your heart rate's elevated, a bunch of other things. So there's really four main things that comprise that post-exercise oxygen consumption. Okay. And what it is, is your heart rate, your heart rate's still elevated, so your heart rate's gonna have to come down. And obviously as your heart rate's still up, you're burning more calories. Okay. Then you're gonna have your actual core body temperature. Okay. That's gonna incinerate some more calories. Then you have another interesting system called the lactate system. So when you work out, you produce lactate. It's a byproduct. Well, the cool thing is that lactate actually goes through a specific cycle and gets converted back into glycogen, stored carbohydrates in your muscles. This takes energy. It actually takes a lot of energy to go through this process. So that excess lactate that you produce from a hard workout gets converted and it takes energy. Then we have what's called the reoxygenation of myoglobin and hemoglobin. This is a pretty complex thing. Honestly, it goes beyond a lot of my knowledge base too. So I'll save that for another video where I can do some more research. So the Journal of Physiology published a study that found on average that the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption amounted for about six to 15% of the total calories burned overall after a workout. So what that means is, hypothetically, if you burned 100 calories during your workout, your epoch would amount to about six to 15 calories. So after your workout, you're burning an additional six to 15 calories just as a result from your workout. That doesn't sound like much, but as the workouts start climbing in intensity and duration, this can actually add up quite a bit. Of course, I'm sure there's a line of diminishing return as well, but I wanted to find out how long does this really last and is it really something worth noting? So the Journal of Diabetes Care published a study that took a look at 40 men. These were specifically inactive men, so it's kind of interesting. So their results might be a little bit different because there's less overall muscle mass, but they wanted to look at their resting energy expenditure. And what they did is they broke them down into four groups, a control group, a low intensity group, a moderate group, and a high intensity group. And what they found is that the low and moderate intensity groups actually had elevated epoch, elevated post-exercise oxygen consumption, all the way up to 48 hours. But the high intensity group had elevated oxygen consumption or elevated energy expenditure all the way up to 72 hours. Okay, so we now know that we definitely wanna be doing more intense stuff. It's gonna cause a little bit of a long tail effect. Now, at 72 hours, it's very negligible, a very negligible difference. It's not like it's gonna warrant you going out and eating a pizza because you're still incinerating. It doesn't work like that at all. In fact, leads me into the next study. This study was published in the Research Quarterly in Exercise and Sport. This one took a look at three different groups, 45 minutes of weight training group, a 45 minutes of cardio group, and a 45 minutes of interval training group. So intervals doing like on and off, like two minutes on or one minute on, two minutes off, just different kinds of intervals. What they found is that the epoch was significantly higher in the resistance training group, the weight training group, and the interval group than compared to the cardio group. The cardio group ended up on average burning 12 calories per hour less than the interval group and the resistance training group. Now, the interval group could be two different things. In my definition, there's cardio intervals, like where you're hopping on a bike and you're doing intervals like that, 
or there's high intensity interval training where you're doing more functional HIIT. You're doing high intensity intervals like with battle ropes and with push ups and plyometrics where you're incorporating the whole body. Obviously, that's going to be a different ball game. Now, that's not broken down in studies, but we do have to take into consideration that cardio intervals where we're really just working the heart and getting the heart rate up probably aren't going to elicit as much of, say, that lactate response that we would get if we were using all of our muscles, right? So, full body is going to elicit a better response. But that leads me into the next study. This study was published in the journal Metabolism, and this one took a look at specifically just cardio oriented workouts. So, they had test subjects train at either 29% VO2 max, 50% VO2 max, or 75% VO2 max. Well, lo and behold, they found, of course, that the 75% VO2 max group ended up having significantly higher EPOC. They ended up burning about 150 more calories over the course of 10 and a half hours. So their EPOC lasted for 10 and a half hours. That's an extra 150 calories. That's pretty awesome. Okay, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but quite frankly, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's like a fun size Snickers bar. I mean, that's actually a decent amount just in extra calorie burn. But one thing that I want to bring into the equation is that the larger your muscles get, the more of that lactate response you're going to end up having, the more of that lactate to glycogen process. So that's going to amount to a greater proportion of your post-exercise oxygen consumption. So these numbers can be widely skewed depending on how much muscle you have. So if you don't have a whole lot of muscle mass, you could probably get away with doing interval training that's just on a bike because you're not going to get as much anyway. But if you're a bigger person, a heavily muscled person, you want to move that body. Okay, you want to move it, you want to be doing compound movements, you want to be doing HIIT that's going to involve battle ropes in your whole body because then you're getting this massive depletion of glycogen, but you're also getting a massive creation of lactic acid and lactate that takes a lot of energy for the body to recover. The thing is, I don't think that the heart rate plays a huge role in EPOC. I think the heart rate only really, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes because it doesn't take that long for your heart rate to come back down. It's not like your heart rate stays crazy elevated for an extended period of time. That comes back down. And even the reoxygenation of myoglobin and hemoglobin doesn't take a whole lot of time. But it's really that lactate process that really takes the most time. So I would argue that that's the big one. So when you're weight training, that's the big response you're getting. The other thing that we have to factor into the equation is just your resting metabolic rate. The more muscle you have, the more resting metabolic rate you have. It's a higher level. So that means you're going to burn more calories just walking around anyway. These are the kind of things you want to be paying attention to. Now, last but not least, there's a study that was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine and Physical Fitness. This one took a look at 14 athletes, so 14 resistance trained athletes. This is really cool. So what they wanted to study here was if caffeine actually had an effect on excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Well, it definitely did. So what they had them do in this study is they had them train with specific workouts with caffeine and then later on they had them do that same workout but without caffeine. Well, guess what they found? They found that when they had the caffeine, there was a significant increase in excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. They actually burned more calories after their workout simply by having caffeine before their workout. That's pretty darn cool. And they found that their total energy expenditure for the entire aggregate of the workout increased 15%. Now, obviously by now, you've seen my videos, you know I'm a fan of coffee and a fan of caffeine, so heck, have your caffeine before a workout. It's going to work out. You could also have your caffeine post-workout for additional effects. So you're probably wondering, how long do you actually burn fat after workout then? Like, did this video really solve anything? The fact of the matter is, is that a lot of it is allocated towards the early part. You're burning most of your calories 30 minutes after your workout. The rest is a very negligible amount. Sure, it's nothing to sneeze at when you add it up, but honestly, because of the hormonal response that occurs when you train heavy and train hard, you're more likely to consume those extra calories and negate the effects of it. So the big window is right after the workout. So the best thing that you can do is wait just a little bit after your workout so you can capitalize on that post-exercise oxygen consumption before you have your post-workout meal. Just ride the wave a little bit, okay? Ride that wave after the workout just for a tiny bit so you can burn a few extra calories before you shut that whole process off. As always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my videos. And if you have ideas for a future one, put them down below. We'll see you soon.